Okay. So good morning again. And uh, we, in the class before, uh, we, were we were discussing about vectors. And in the last class, I shared some videos which will be useful for you for the CAA and also in general vectors as well. I hope you watch the videos. I hope uh, you understood it. And if you are, ha if you have any problems with that, please do contact and let me know. Okay. In that, we must have learned about blue-white screening. We we also by using PBR three twenty two. This one will be PUC 18 or so. And then we also learned about, when you discuss this, we also learned about insertional inactivation, what it means. That is insertion of a fragment might inactivate a marker gene. And we also know about alpha complementation with regard to um, laxate, beta galactosidase formation, and so on and then blue-white screening, whether a colony gives blue or white. Similarly, there is PBR322, <clears throat> which can be used by replica plating. That is what you should be. Uh, that's the thing. That's the new thing there, replica plating. And based on that, we can figure out which of the colonies are recombinant and which of the colonies are non-recombinant. Again, I would want you to remember when we have, when we take a recombinant DNA, we may have vector vector relegation also. We may have, I said, this is the recombinant with vector and fragmentation. Then we try to transform it into E. coli. And not that all of them, some cells would get the plasmids, any of them and some would not get. The ones that you did not get are referred to as non-transformants. That means they did not get any, they did not take up the DNA from outside. And those that have taken are referred to as the transformants. The transformants, there will be two categories. One of it is non-recombinant, that is the vector vector relegation one. The other one is recombinant. That is the one that we are actually looking for. That is vector plus fragment. Okay. The terminology should be clear. Non-transformants, transformants, non-recombinants, recombinants. How do we differentiate or select transformants from non-transformants? That is where we use selectable markers such as antibiotic resistances like ampicillin, tetracycline, and so on, chloramphenicol, resistance genes. And, uh, the ampicillin resistance genes, that it most often we call it as the, it produces an enzyme called as beta-lactamase. Um, and then we have non-recombinants and recombinants, which should be differentiated. They can be differentiated using, um, using blue white screening like which can give a chromogenic which is chromogenic that is light based on visible visual light we can differentiate which one is recombinant or non-recombinant or we could also use an extra selectable marker such as in the pbr322 where tetracycline resistance gene and ampicillin resistance gene are there two of them one to differentiate which one is transformants and non-transformants and wants to differentiate which one is recombinant and non-recombinant. Please re-watch the videos, and if you have any questions, please get back to me. And you can also post questions now itself if you have, and then I would still I would um, make time for it. So what I'm going to do is, today, what I want to discuss is about phages and more specifically about lambda phages. I think we already started this, and we were discussing, we discussed about lysogeny, we discussed about lysis, lytic life cycle, and what is meant by prophage. That is, if a phage genome integrates into the bacterial genome, that 
time you call it as prophage. So lambda phage is called a temperate phage because it can undertake either lysogeny or lysogenic cycle or light, lytic cycle. So what we are going to use mostly as a as an express as a vector is mostly that is involved with lytic cycle. This is also useful, but it is at a different time point. And we also discussed about the genome. It is about 48 KB or somewhere around that. And it is double stranded and it is um, linear. Linear when it is present in the head. This is the capsid or you call it the head. There will be a tails and other thing. When the DNA is inserted into the genome and it gets um, it gets circularized at these overhangs. These overhangs are called as cohesive ends. They are complementary because of which they will circularize and the host ligase will seal it up. So what was linear DNA will become double-stranded DNA, I mean circular DNA. So these are the cohesive ends or once the, this is the cohesive ends, so you call that as cos site. And once the, it is circularized, it undergoes theta mode of replication, and then it will form multiple copies and then shift to rolling circle replication, resulting in formation of multiple length linear DNA, which are which is called as conketamer. That is end-to-end -end joint. Each one of it is uh, is one lambda genome. So when it gets packaged it should this dna should get packaged right and uh, not the head particle has a constraint it cannot take more than say for example 48 kb there is only limited space for 48 kb the distance between one cost site to another cost site is about that is one lambda length right that is about 48 kb so we don't need to go into all the details, but I want you to uh, understand these things that, so the conketamer comes something like this. One second, let me use a different thing. So the conketamer is coming like this, and assume this is a cos site. This gets attached to a protein in the near the head particle. And the rest of the DNA, the all of this one, is pushed into the uh, head particle. I'll try to see how it is pushed. Okay, I'm going to redraw. So one cause site was recognized, and then the rest of the DNA is pushed into the inside, keeps packaging inside until another cause site is experienced. So this one goes first, and then the, all this DNA is pushed into the head, and then the second, the cause site will come. When the cause site comes, it makes a cut. And that is how the cohesive ends I showed you about 12 bases of overhang. That 12 base overhang comes from that region. And so the, when after it is packaged, it is linear and single one length of lambda DNA with cause cohesive ends, OK, overhangs. That is how packaging happens. And then the whole phage is assembled. I mean, once it is cut, you will have these things gone away. And the rest of the head, tail, and other parts are organized. And uh, it is ready for, when once it is released, it will infect a bacterium and then inject the DNA into it, and the cycle goes on. So why I brought this up is you should understand the importance of cause site here if a dna does not have cause site then it will not be recognized by these head particles i mean it cannot get packaged into the head particles and there is also a constraint it can only take about five percent more of it something say 52 kb maximum capacity is 52 kb if you put less amount into it if there is less than, uh, say, 37 KB, I'm just giving up 37 KB, 
they somehow the head particle does not form virulent phages. OK, so these are some of the conditions that we have to remember. E try to understand each of the points. They're all going to be useful for application. And that is why I'm spending time discussing it. Just uh, wanted to check. Yes. So um, yes, what did we learn in this is there are space constraints. Space constraints in the head particle. So the DNA should be about 37 to 52 kb approximately. OK, the correct numbers, uh, this is an approximation. Space uh, constraints within the head particle. The second thing, important one, is that for any DNA to be packaged into the head, the most important constraint is the cos site. If there is a lambda DNA without a cos site, it would never get packaged into the head particle. If there is a DNA that has a any DNA that has a cos site, it will get packaged. The point that should be for packaging alone, OK? For packaging alone, there should be something like this. Cos site and cos site. And the distance between the cos site should be somewhere approximately 37 to 52 kb. Not more than that or not less than this, less than 37 kb. OK? So these are some things that you need to remember. And now we are actually in a position to try to understand how these uh, lambda phage can be used as a vector. First thing, there are two different types of vectors possible based on uh, the categories that insertional vectors, insertional, and the other one is called as replacement. As the name suggests, insertional means there is the lambda DNA. And you can just put the DNA of your interest or the clone. You want to clone something, you're adding into the lambda genome. That is insertion, right? The replacement, the basic concept is that you have DNA and you are erasing some part of it. Sorry. You are erasing or removing some part of it and adding gene of interest. Which one is good for cloning? Good in the sense here, the size matters. How much amount of DNA can be cloned? Size of DNA that can be cloned. That is our constraint. So as I said, this is insertional, and this one is replacement. And in the previous slide, we have discussed something. So the length should be between 37 to 52 or so, approximately, as I read. I will repeat that approximately all the time, because it could be a little bit different. The concept remains the same. If I want to clone a big, a large fragment, the lambda genome is already about 48 kb. How much more DNA can I clone into it? 52 means, at the most, the more, uh, if it is insertional, the maximum I can clone is 4 kb. And I cannot clone it anywhere I want. There are certain restriction sites. Say this is an artificial vector or modified uh, lambda where it is called uh, GT10. They have engineered a unique ECOR1 site. And there is a re region within the lambda DNA where it is referred to as immunity DNA, immunity region where you can clone. If I forgot to mention, I would also want to um, clarify here. There is lambda genome, lambda DNA, assume, from here to here, cos site. We have approximately, we call this as left arm and this as right arm. Lambda genome has. What is the purpose of a genome in general? It is to make the whole organism. It is the manifestation 
it should be able to manifest in into a physical organism that can be that can propagate we are all beings of we are all information we are all our genetic information and the genetic information dictates every aspect almost every aspect of every organism the genetic information is in the physical form we, it is genome but what is in the genome <clears throat> it is the information because of which we grow we grow as an embryo we grow into a small child we grow larger everything is determined by it this is the essence the body and the all the developmental processes that have happened are and are yet to happen are all consequences of our genetic information the same way lambda gen, gen, genome or lambda dna also has all the information to carry out to form the phages okay it has to form multiple phages and re redo the uh, the life cycle like it is recapitulating the whole sequence of things that happen in every lambda phage. It has to form one infection, Could, should be able to make more phage replication. It should also form the head, tail, and other regions, parts, and then it should assemble, and then it should be released for further infection, and this cycle should happen. So the genes for it needs therefore it needs genes for replication it needs genes for replication it needs genes to have the phages the capsids and other things formed right so if i if i say one second i'll show you this slide yes so these are regions left arm uh, is about 32 kb and right arm is about 10 kb each arm the, the arms are important regions which are which has which have genes which has genes for replication capsid formation and so on so you cannot just insert anything into those regions right there then if you are doing that insertional inactivation may happen and the lambda upon upon infection into bacterium may fail to grow may fail to replicate or form new phages and then it doesn't form plaques. So this is called as immunity region, region because that is where even if you insert, nothing bad happens. Okay, this cell, the phage can still infect bacteria, bacteria and uh, form more phages and thereby forming plaques. Then cloning is happening. That is insertional vector. The point is there is a limitation. Here, this is an artificial one. It is about 43 kb. Then, if I said maximum that it, the head particle space constraints is 52 kb, maybe you can uh, you can one can clone about 10 kb, probably max of that. That is still good. Why do we actually need phages, phage vectors in plasmids? We can clone. There are we can clone large amounts of fragments, but typically they are about four kb or so, or say five to ten five kb. That is the size. The vector itself could be three kb. The problem is if you you can theoretically clone ten kb or twenty kb also. It has the origin of replication. There is selectable marker. The biggest problem will be during transformation step. If you try to transform a large DNA, say something that is 10 KB or 20, 15 KB, it becomes very difficult to be transformed or taken up by the bacterium. So theoretically, plasmid is good and it is uh, unlimited amount of DNA can be put. But then the problem is transformation, OK? That is when we can use uh, phages. Phages are good because they are able to inject 
about 50 kb of dna into bacterial cell this is kind of active injection system it is it has it can make pores and put in the dna whereas in the normal transformation that we are discussing it is an artificial process and for that to be taken up it's it takes time right more amount of dna the larger the size of the dna the more amount it, uh, time required and there is also if it is very large there is also possibility of breakages and other things during uptake and then degradation degradation and so on whereas in lambda phage there is cos site and uh, it can be injected it will form double stranded dna circular ones inside and that's it so that is one of the reasons why phage vectors are important they can clone larger size as we will see in the next slides and they have an active way of injecting the dna we don't have to rely on this passive transformation right that increases the efficiency of phage phages a lot so the next one we discussed about insertional vectors so far with gt10 and the limitation maximum that you can clone in a vector like this would be around uh, maybe 10 kb that is a significant improvement replacement vector is is embl3 uh, 3a or 4 is there are several series on that european molecular biology lab that is a famous set of labs around in europe they perform um, high class research work it will be nice if you can try to be there i think some people might be there already some of our shasta people so that's a good thing you might also try so <clears throat> we are now going to talk about a replacement vector the basic concept is there is lambda dna we take away some part of it and replace it with uh, replace it with gene of interest so we keep the size we can increase the amount of clonable dna but then we cannot remove all the dna as such right there is a requirement left arm and right arm this is an artificially constructed so that uh, the, all the genes required for structural genes and replication are retained. And the middle region, which is not really required, is kept as tougher, which is about 14 kb. Right? So left arm is 20 kb, right arm is 9 kb. We will see, I will repeat in the next slide, which is a little more complex. So try to pay attention to the simple one. What we can then do is use damage one and cut the regions, remove the stuffer. You can do electrophoresis so that you will get, if you have done electrophoresis, you'll get it in three bands. And you can identify which one is the stuffer. You cut that out, remove, and then the other two are eluted. And then uh, you use those for ligation. You also take a BAMH1 uh, insert, which is having BAMH1 overhangs on either side, and then you ligate. OK? This is the general mechanism. Now we will look into a picture. I hope uh, it, is, it is referred to as EMBL3A. It is almost the same, except there are few differences. Left arm is about 20 kb. 9 kb right arm as is in the previous slide and the stuffer region is 14 kb the other the important differences are some of the restriction sites eco r1 bam h1 sal1 and they have it in the reverse order on the other side of the stuffer sal1 bam h1 eco r1 if you're reading it this way in this one it is in this way isn't it the order of restriction size, eco R1, BAM H1, SAL1, and SAL1, BAM H1, eco R1. There is a reason for it, and we will see that. And you can also appreciate, if you can see it, there are some problems, right? That if we ligate the insert and these two, there is also a problem that you might end up forming the left arm, right arm also. All right? 
So these are some of the problems that are there. That is why this is a complex one that is made. This one picture, if you understood, I think you will, you would have understood everything uh, in vectors. I mean, what I meant is the, if you can understand these complexities, you understood everything. This particular figure, I might use it multiple times. Um, based on in gene library as well as in three, three, EMBL 3A. So see if you can understand slowly some things. So there are there is one more thing um, about it. I also have to say that one. So before that, I will I'll go into something else. So there is say for example there is an E. coli. And I call it as it is P2 lysogen, which means, what does that mean? That means it has a genome. It has genome. And I'm saying it is P2 lysogen, P2, which means it has P2 prophage. So you call it as P2 lysogen. P2 is a another uh, something, another bacteriophage like lambda. So P2 lysogen is there. If I, if lambda DNA, if there is lambda DNA that is coming and trying to, it infects, if it infects here, uh, this cell, somehow lambda DNA does not replicate. It fails to grow on P2 lysogen. That is called as spy phenotype. Sensitivity, okay, are sensitive to P2 inhibition. So the P2 prophage somehow in, inhibits the lambda lyse, uh, lambda phage, so it does not form plaques on on E. coli P2 lysogen. So the same lambda, if it were infecting normal E. coli. This is normal, it's not. And then it doesn't have any problem. Lambda DNA will grow here and form more phages and the lytic cycle can happen. So if it can form, you call it as inhibition is negative, right? There is no negative, there is no inhibition. If it can form plaques, you call it as phi negative. If it can cannot form plaques, then you call it as pi positive. That means it is sensitive to P2 inhibition. So people worked on it, and we don't know all of the details. But what they found is if lambda DNA has these two genes, which are recombinases, red and gam, they are involved with, there are if we dig, keep digging, there will be more and more biology. We, we're not going to all of those details. But if you have lambda DNA like this, it is spy positive. What does that mean? It cannot grow, cannot grow on P2 lysogen. If there is a lambda DNA, which is red minus, and gam minus. That means red and genes, uh, red and gam genes were removed from this lambda. It is spy negative. Can grow on P2 lysogen. I hope you understood what is P2 lysogen. Okay. I will just quickly repeat. So if you have any questions, you can also ask. Normally, lambda phage can infect E. coli, and it will give rise to more phages, and it can reproduce in that sense. But if the same lambda, that is the wild type, if it infects a P2 lysogen, P2 lysogen is an E. coli, which has P2 prophage on its genome. So somehow, the P2, P2 prophage inhibits the, the, uh, the replication of Red, uh, of lambda, wild type lambda. 
So that is called as spy phenotype, sensitive to P2 inhibition. So if lambda phage can make plaques, you call it as P2. Um, yeah, well, we'll come to this. The reason is lambda has two genes, red and gam. Those are recombinases. If they are there, lambda cannot grow on P2 lysogen. So you call it as spy positive. It is, it is sensitive to P2 inhibition. Whereas lambda is, um, if we have a mutant lambda where red and gam genes are removed, then it is spy negative, can grow in P2 on P2 lysogen. Okay, it can form plaques. Whereas here it cannot form plaques. So I think we have enough setting to understand this scheme here. So it is trying to make gene library. We will work on what is meant by gene library later. We don't have to worry about it. Our focus now is about the lambda vector. So here, for gene of interest is the genomic DNA fragment and so on. This part is not our concern at this time. OK, this could be any fragment that you want to clone into EMBL3A. So let's look at the structure of or the genetic architecture of EMBL3A. It has, it has left arm, right arm, and it also has this tougher region. And then we discussed that it has three, SAL, BAM, and SAL1, BAMH1, EQR1. And you also have the reverse of it, EQR1, BAMH1, SAL1. And this is the left arm, and here is the right arm. And the middle is the uh, stuffer region, which also has red and gam. I hope you remember that these two are responsible for this spy phenotype that we just spoke of in the previous slide. So we'll just go through the scheme, and then we'll try to understand what happens. So if you take EMBL3A, lambda EMBL3A vector, digest it with BAMH1 and EQR1. So it should typically cut at, um, say, for example, I'll try to redraw it, OK? So SAL1, BAMH1, EQR1. Just give me a minute. I'll redo. So SAL1, BAMH1, EQR1. I'm just putting it a little distant for easy understanding. They are actually much closer. And here we have a red and GAN. If I cut it, we use restriction endonucleases, um, BAMH1 and EQR1. It will cut here and here, right? We'll put it like that. The same will happen on the other one also. BAMH1 and SAL1, right? So we'll have the overhangs here are BAMH1, EQR1. This is EQR1 overhang. Um, sorry, I made a mistake here. Yes. This will be EQR1 overhang, BAMH1 overhang. And uh, eco, yeah, sorry, eco R1, damage one, damage one. That's how it is. Yes, this is how it is, right? And you have a sal one here. Now you can see it here shown like this. This is the left arm, and here is the right arm. Let me zoom in maybe. So what's happening here? You have a left arm, and there is right arm. And we used BAMH1 and EQR1. So BAMH1 overhang is here. This will be another BAMH1 overhang. Here will be the EQR1 overhang. And same is the case here, EQR1 and BAMH1. These are polylinker oligonucleotides, very small ones, actually. So if we, if we try to precipitate, you have to remember that this is 20 KB, this is about 9 KB, and this is about 14 KB. If we do isopropanol precipitation, 
Which ones do you think will precipitate faster? Yes, anybody? The larger ones will precipitate faster or the smaller ones will precipitate faster? The larger ones will precipitate the larger faster. One. That's right. Thanks. And the smaller ones, these are actually just about 10 bases or so approximately. They would be in the solution. If I remove the supernatant, then all the small ones will be taken out. Then what am I left with? If I didn't take take it out, what would have happened? Say, if, um, why am I taking them out? If I add ligase to this, this scenario, what would happen? BAM H1 can ligate with BAM H1. Eco R1 overhang can ligate with Eco R1 overhang. It will reform, isn't it? Whatever is there, it will just, the restriction duration could be reversed. Instead, if I removed the, these polylinkers here, what am I left with? Left arm has BAM H1 overhang. And the stuffer region has eco R1 overhang. They are not compatible, so they cannot uh, like it. The same is the case with the other, on the other side as well. The right arm has BAM H1 overhang, but stuffer has eco R1 overhang. So there is theoretically at least no way that the stuffer can get ligated. And that is why we went through this process. And that is the same reason why they have made designed the restriction endonucleases in this way. That is fantastic thinking, isn't it? So <clears throat> once that has happened, you would also get your gene of interest. We will get to that later. And we would mix it and like it. As always, we will try to see what are all the possibilities and then try to address why we are doing it in this uh, particular scheme. So now think of it as you have the left arm. OK, I'll just put it as L. There are There is S, that is the stuffer region. And there is right arm. And now we are also adding a fragment of interest. I'll just say it as fragment. We also have fragment. We will take the fragment to be about 14 KB or so, say. Yeah, we can say it as 50, uh, sorry, 20 KB. OK? You have four different types of fragments. You mix them up. And of course, there are multiples of each of them, right? N, N. You mix them, and you ligate it. What are all the possibilities that would happen? You can look at in this case, and sau 3 a is an overhang of BAM H1. Okay, overhang um, sau 3 a and BAM H1 are isocardomers. That means they produce the same um, same ends. BAM H1 is GGA, TCC. Sau 3 a is GATC. Okay, the Cut site for BAM H1 would be here. For South 3A, it would be here. So they produce same uh, overhangs. OK? So why we use South 3 here, we will discuss it later when we are discussing about genome um, or maybe in the next class. That is That has to do with genomic library. So, so what are the possibilities looking at when we ligate like this? First thing is, can you can write several combinations, L, S, R, L, L, R, R. What else are there? L, F, R, and F, S, F. You can also have L, F, L, R, F, L. I hope you understand left arm. Right arm, fragment, left arm, and stuffer region. I'm just trying to say what are all the possibilities that can uh, that can form upon ligation. 
and then we'll look at all possibilities then we will narrow down to the most probable one that's how we should we are approaching it we'll also get this out of all these things what is the most what is the uh, combination that we are actually looking for we want recombinants so this would be left arm fragment and right arm is what we are looking for so the first question is you have to answer the the question is lsr can this form or not and why anybody yes can anybody answer this, please? So you have to look at ligase, uh, ligation reaction. Can left arm ligate with stuffer region? No, because left arm has overhang of BAMH1, whereas stuffer region has EcoR1 overhang. So this is not a possibility. Can L and L form? Yes, L has a left left arm has a BAMH one ring, uh, BAMH one overhang. Another left arm arm will have another BAMH one, so that is a possibility. Right arm and right arm, yes, that is a possibility. Can you get? Um, we can also get L and R. If I didn't write that, L and R, yes, that is also a possibility, because the overhangs are matching then ligase can ligate them. L and F, I said South 3A and BAMH1 are isochromers, so that is a possibility. R and fragment, yes. Stuffer and fragment, no, because stuffer has eco R1 overhangs, whereas fragment has BAMH1 overhangs. Can L, F, L form, yes. And R and F, L form, just by ligation I'm talking. Yes. Can L, F, and R form? That is also yes. We are talking about all the possible combinations of things that can, uh, po possible combinations when we are ligating. This is based solely on the overhangs. But as I said in the previous slide, we had another point to do, right? What is the, uh, what is the, importance of left arm and right arm the left arm and right arm one one of the arms is important for formation of the head regions head particles and so on the other part right arm is important for uh, sorry left arm i think is important for propagation uh, replication and so on the right arm is for formation of head particles and so on right so now you can also think about it. Assume that all these combinations have formed. Is there a possibility that it can replicate? Can LSR replicate? Yes or no? It has left arm and right arm, so it can replicate because it can replicate the DNA and it can also form the head particles, so it can form plaques. L and L, maybe it will replicate but cannot form plaques because the head particles are, re are missing. I mean, the genes for forming the head, tail, and other things are missing. R, R will not form plaques because there is no genes for replication. If L and R are formed, they can form plaques because they have all the essential genes required for that. L and F cannot because R is missing. In R and F, L is missing because both are useless in s and f stuff region and fragment alone they're useless l f l r is missing so it cannot form plaques uh, r f l this is the same as almost uh, this one right and l f l l f r yes it can form because it has both left and right so all the genes are required. All the genes that are present in left arm and right arm are important for formation of plaques. Okay? That is the one thing.
So the second one we discussed is one the first one point we discussed is about ligation. What are the possibilities that will form? Second thing is which ones can form plaques? That is what we have discussed. There is yet another one. The third is we also discussed about the size requirements. There are constraints about the DNA that can be packaged into lambda head. Right, there is a it can hold about um, this actual size is about 48 kb approximately, so it can hold up to 53, or say we will just go by 53 kb, and the minimum should be around I think 38 kb. So now, if you look at let's look at which ones are forming falling in that range. Left arm is 20 kb, if you want to remember. Left arm is 20 kb. Stuffer region, we put it as 14. And right is uh, 9 kb. And fragment is approximately, say, 20 kb. We are now looking at which all, which all of these combinations can form, can be packaged. L, S, R. Can they be packaged? Yes. They will form 20 plus 20 or 14, 34, 9. It will fall in the range, within this range. So it can be packaged. LL, yes, it, it 20 plus 20, it is falling 40 KB. So it should be R, 9 plus 9, 18, no. L and R will be 29, no. This can be packaged. L plus F. R and F, no. And there is one more thing we also need to discuss is for packaging, there is one more constraint. That is the cost site. The stuffer region and the fragment that we are adding do not have cost site. So they will not get packaged. Although the size could, could match even then. L, F, L. It can be packaged, this can be packaged, and this can be packaged. So the reason why I'm telling and trying to focus on this is you are seeing a complex scheme. And people have designed the, the vector, keeping all these things in mind. And why are they doing all these things is to increase the probability of it is to increase the probability of this formation. We want recombinant plaques, right? We want to eliminate all these things. Everywhere, this is the probably the only one which has got all the three ticks, right? You do not you hear one or the other ways the other combinations will fail. So when you plate this, and you look into the plate and you find flocks, you are more than 99% sure that they are recombinant, if everything was followed accurately. So I hope, uh, yeah, in the last, I will just review this one and this one thing, and then we will discuss uh, later in the next class. So in this protocol, we are choosing based on ligation which of these fragments can be ligated, probabilities. We are also using whether they can form plaques or not, whether the L and R genes are, or the arms are present or not. Then we are also having cost site, whether they have cost sites or not, and whether they are falling within the range that can be packaged into the head particle or not. So this can be as the packaging. There is yet another one that I haven't touched, uh, I gave you introduction to, but we will discuss in the next class maybe, that is about uh, using this pi 2. There is one more element that we is in EMBL3A is the presence of red and gam genes within the stuffer. Say, because you used 
because you used restriction endonucleases, maybe they did not cut, and because some errors because of which LSR formed, the size is appropriate, the cos sites are present, and both the L and R are present because of which all the essential genes re required for formation of plaque are also present. Then what to do? So I will erase all the rest. I will just keep them there. So you have two combinations. Both can do all of them. So L, S, R, we don't want that. L, fragment, and R, this is the recombinant that we want. Both can form plaques. But assume you had DNA like this, and then you have ligated it onto you have packaged both can be packaged well and now you have to transfect it and if i transfect it to e coli can lsr form a plaque it will form a plaque because it has all the genes can lfr with the fragment the recombinant form a plaque yes that will also form a plaque right then if there are plaques, we are not sure which one is the recombinant, which one is the non-recombinant. So what the reason for putting red and gam genes within the stuffer region is if I transfect into P2 lysogen, E. coli with P2 uh, prophage, then LSR has red and gam. In the S region, in the stuffer region, there are red and gam. As I discussed in the previous slide, if red and gam are there, they fail to inhibit, uh, they fail to infect P2 lysogen or form plaques on P2 lysogen. So they do not form plaques there. Whereas if fragment is present, L, F, R present, they will form plaques on P2 lysogen only. If it is a normal wild type E. coli, non-lysogen, then it does not form plaques. It forms plaque. Both of them will form. If it is P2 lysogen, only the recombinant will form the plaques, and the non-recombinant will not form the plaques. I hope you understood. Uh, if not, watch the videos once again. I think in the previous videos, that the ones that I shared yesterday also had some of it. You can try. And please come up with questions so that I can address specifically or try to discuss the same in a different ways with our, so that you will understand better. Everything is here. It's all about how you're seeing it. Left arm, uh, right arm. Why did they design restriction sites like this? Why have three of them? Next is, why do they have red and gam here? They also included uh, cell one. If I just use cell, this fragment will become much smaller, right? If there is another uh, cloning protocol, you can use it that for. But the one that we are discussing is the most complex one. And it is the most intellectual one in that sense. In majority of the questions that you will have during the next uh, CA onwards, you will have to design properly. You should have an idea about how you can design. OK, so that um, you will be able to achieve your target. So think on those lines and see why did they have these genetic elements at this location in this order in this way. OK, any questions? Anybody? No, sir. No, okay. sir. Anything about CIA? Okay. Sir, I just have one yeah. basic doubt, uh, not yes, with respect yes. to the cloning aspect of it. Uh, but okay. you mentioned that the larger fragments would precipitate faster. Is there any specific yes. reason why? Okay. Uh, where is it? Yes. So there doesn't have to be a specific reason for it, but what is the precipitation happening? First of all, 
we use isopropanol and we are also going to do centrifugation right and if you have these the larger molecules uh, say this is dna it is uh, it has charges and you are putting in something nonpolar and then or you are adding because of isopropanol or ethanol you are adding they wouldn't want to interact and they will start sticking to each other and they will form clumps the smaller ones will experience lesser in that sense it also depends on how much what is the concentration of isopropanol you are using and when you centrifuge these will settle much faster i think in majority of the protocols that you might have done in molecular biology lab you would have used 70% uh, sorry you would have used isopropanol for precipitation of nucleic acids along with sodium acetate or so on. right that is to facilitate precipitation the larger ones are likely to precipitate much faster than the smaller ones okay and these smaller ones as i said they are just uh, they could be very small some 10 base pairs whereas these we are talking about 20 kb and so on okay okay sir like i thought uh, yeah. the smaller ones would have uh, more possibility for interacting with those particular reagents the isopropanol and other ones thereby leading to faster precipitation why would they be more why because not the these base pairs so it'll be easy for them like it'll be easy for the precipitation reaction i, I agree with that why not the larger ones I thought it would take some more time, sir, because of the increasing length. Because of the increasing length, the DNA is highly negative, right? It is very difficult to put it into a clump. So why do histones have a lot of basic amino acids? And that is why, because of histones, basic amino acids, they're able to neutralize the negative charges. And that is when you are able to coil the DNA like this. OK, so there is no reason why uh, the, the, there is no way that, or in the normal conditions, DNA doesn't um, electrostatically, it doesn't want to, it cannot be clumped. And when you put it in aqueous solution, and you're talking about atom level, everything is exposed to everything except maybe proteins if you're looking at proteins they are different all the hydrophobic ones are on the inside if it is globular and the hydrophilic ones are on the outside that is different in dna or nucleic acids you have uniform negative charge and therefore they they interact with the uh, surrounding aqueous phase very well Okay. Okay. So, okay. But we can. You can so also have a look at it, and we can. Yes. 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 Go ahead. Uh, so the idea is all of them could be simultaneously attacked for the water for the want of a better word. Like. Okay. Every other by other what? By the precipitating agents. Okay. So you're saying this would be even more faster. Uh, yeah, there are two things, right? We, we also have weight, okay? There is weight because there is also centrifugation step. That centrifugation happens based on the weight, right? The larger ones are likely to precipitate faster and the smaller yeah, ones okay. slower. So if we did not add isopropanol and uh, then nothing would be precipitated because if this is continuously in aqueous phase, if they're interacting everything, precipitation would become difficult. By addition of isopropanol, you are re reducing the dissolvability of DNA in water. That means you're forcing it to precipitate like this. And when you centrifuge it, then you'll have larger ones pre precipitate faster and smaller ones, very tiny ones. They're relatively very big. So you can just use probably 20,000 RPM or something like that, 2,000 RPM or something like that to precipitate something, uh, larger ones, to differentiate between 
very tiny ones from very large ones. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Yes. yes. So by I'll see if there is anything the... better. Yes. 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 Yeah. There are two things, of course. Okay. So also with respect yeah. to yes. CIA. The others can. Uh, is there any recommended? Yeah. Yes, say it again, please. Uh, with respect to the CIA, sir, is there any chapters okay. that we would have to, we could look into uh, in the reference books? Classes only. You can look in the, look up the books also, but the topics are same, and uh, most of the questions will be in line with what has been taught. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Sir. Yes. To, shall Thank we have a discussion session on the questions that you posted yesterday, sir? Well, did you all have a discussion about it? Uh, we have not yet started, <laughs> sir, but we would very much like to. Um, I hope you have a discussion, and then it will be nice. Be OK, we'll have a discussion. When shall we do that? Um, may, shall we well, discuss among ourselves?